Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his very short dialogue, The Ion, as Socrates and the interlocutor after whom the, the dialogue is named, Ion, a rhapsode, an interpreter of Homer's poetry, they engage in a discussion about the nature of poetry and about what's going on when the poet or the rhapsode is engaging in composition or interpretation. <clears throat> Socrates, is, and Plato is doing this, is steering Ion towards what we can call a theory of divine inspiration or enthusiasm or possession. And Ion is just sort of going along for the ride. He's not really sure what happens with him uh, when he's interpreting. And he, he seems to find that, that what Socrates puts forward as an explanation fits a good portion of, of his experience, but, but not all of it. Socrates, and I'm doing another core concept video on, on this, so I'm not going to elaborate this, Socrates is engaged in trying to see whether Ion actually does what he does from art or skill or knowledge. In Greek, episteme, or techne. Does he have a kind of craft by which he is able to judge between the better and the worse of other people in that craft, not just Homer, um, does he actually have knowledge pertaining to the things that are, <clears throat> that are being discussed in the poetry that he's interpreting, or is something else going on? And as it turns out, uh, there's a lot of discussion of this, it turns out that according to Plato, the poet does not really possess knowledge. So, how is the poet, and when we think poet, what we ought to think is cultural uh, innovator, cultural uh, creator, somebody who is, is, in the Greek terms, not just creating poetry in the sense of nice rhyming verses, but drama, literature. Uh, in our time, the poets would include not only the writers, but also the filmmakers, uh, TV producers, and, and writers, and um, I suppose uh, musicians as well, since they, they write their own lyrics and they, they put those in that. So imagine all of that uh, involved in this, this Greek discussion. So the question is, they're able to have some effects. They're able to speak or to produce cultural artifacts that are very moving, that, that audiences actually like, that audiences feel tell them something, that communicate a certain kind of truth. And how are they doing that? If they're not doing that by knowledge, then what are the other possible alternatives? Maybe they're just lucky? That's not one that, that Socrates considers in this. And... Again, it helps to know a little bit about the ancient Greek context. Poetry, at least some of the poetry, was carried out in relation to religious uh, rituals and festivals, uh, particularly comedy and tragedy, which were written originally as poetry. Um, Homer and Hesiod and, and some of these older poets are writing about the gods, so they're already connected with what you could call theology in general for the Greeks. Uh, that is, discourse about God or the gods. And even the lyric poetry, um, you know, we have hymns to, to particular deities that were used probably liturgically in, in some cases. Um, what's going on with that? Well, you know, one thing that, that's sort of suggested by all this connection with the divine is the poet is actually inspired 
by something divine. So if they're not using strictly human capacities uh, that are acquired by reason and by practice and training of art or skill or science or knowledge, then they're using something that's above that, and it would make sense then why a poet can only speak about certain things, or why some poets only produced one good piece of poetry. Um, other poets, you know, produced many good pieces of poetry, but they, they worked within this genre, or that genre, or that genre. And for the Greeks, it wasn't just a matter of genre, it was also a matter of the very meter of the poetry that you were writing. So, um, the kind of, po the kind of uh, meter that you're using, what I mean by that is, is how the line goes. Think about rap music, and how rap music uses meter. Um, the way that the lines go is determined by the kind of poetry that you're doing. So epic poetry is different than lyric poetry, is different than tragedy, is different than comedy, not only because of the subject matter, but because of the very way in which the words are arranged together. So why is it that some poets are, are you know, able to do this, but not this? Why is it that some poets can treat certain themes, but not others? Why is it that interpreters, instead of being able to interpret the entire corpus of Greek poetry and, you know, say whether somebody is, is speaking well or speaking poorly, not only in Homer, but in Archilochus or in um, Solon or, you know, pick whoever you like, Hesiod, why, are, why is somebody like Ion only able to interpret Homer successfully? Well, if it's a matter of divine inspiration, that would make sense. And the, the, Socrates uses a metaphor to, to explain this. He talks about magnets. And as you all know, because you've experimented with magnets probably when you were kids, if you have a magnet and then you have a piece of iron or steel, I think there's one other element that, that is magnetic as well, and you click the magnet to the piece of steel, the magnetism is transferred in part, although more weakly, to the piece of steel or piece of iron, and that can pick up another one. Now imagine you have a magnet and you have rings, iron rings, and you click one here, and now you click another one here, and now you click another one here. The rings can be suspended, depending on the power of the magnet, pretty far down. And they're not linked together. What's holding them together is the power of the magnet. I suppose, although Plato doesn't actually um, go into this, you could think of a contrary metaphor. If, if you actually possess knowledge, it would be like having a ring, and then another ring through that ring, which is linked, and then another ring through that ring, which is linked, and you would have knowledge you know, as a, a steady chain going all the way down, provided each member of the chain linked itself to the one before in the way that the one before had linked itself to the one prior to that, the right way. In this case, you don't have that. You have this magnet, and you have all of these rings attached to, to that, but they're only attached by magnetic force. Take the magnet away, and suddenly they all fall apart. So that's very different than, than what, what Plato is calling knowledge. Another thing that he focuses on in this very brief discussion, and Ion is, is, is really attuned to this, is the fact that we share... Um, not just knowledge, well not knowledge, we, we share opinion or we share appearances or we share images through poetry, but we also share something even more important which is emotion. So um, I'll just read you know, a few instances, he has this great example. He says, suppose you're reciting epic poetry and thrill the spectators most deeply. You're chanting, say, the story of Odysseus as he leaped up on the dais, unmasked himself to the suitors, and poured the arrows out before his feet. When you chant these, are you in your senses, or are you carried out of yourself, and does not your soul in such an ecstasy conceive itself to be engaged in the actions you relate, whether they're in Ithaca or Troy? And uh, Ion says, yeah, that, that's exactly what happens, Socrates. Um, whenever, I say a, whenever I recite a tale of pity, I feel pity. When I recite a tale of sadness, I feel sadness. When I recite a tale 
in which, you know, in this case, Odysseus is actually um, taking names and kicking ass, so to speak, right? It's at the end of the, the Odyssey, not completely the end, but the end for the suitors, because what is Odysseus doing? He's in his own house where these guys have been trying to date his wife, you know, a whole bunch of them, and acting like, like a bunch of fools for three years, and he unmasks himself. Now they know who he is. We're in this guy's house. He's got a whole set of arrows. He's got a bow that's, that he's the only guy who can actually draw it back because uh, it, it's so, so powerful, and now he just starts laying arrows into these guys. And you feel a sense of emotion when that's, that's going on. Just, you know, talking about it right now, I actually feel a kind of sense of elation uh, a bit in, in speaking about it. Um, but that's because I, I, I know that, that poetry and I know that scene. And also because Homer has depicted the character of Odysseus so well and tied it in with the plot and all these, these sorts of things. Plato would say, and Ion would say, that's what, what is being transmitted at that point is emotion. And this emotion is ecstatic. It's taking, our, uh, it's taking us out of ourselves and into the image, the time, the plot, the situation that is being depicted. So Socrates will say, yeah, it's kind of weird. I mean, think about it. You go to the tragedy and you see these people crying their eyes out, even though nothing bad is happening to them. You see them scared, uh, you know, even though nobody is, is attacking them or despoiling them. How is it that they share those emotions? Well, again, that gets us to this, this metaphor. And I don't have rings here, but, but this is the, the way it, in which it works, according to Socrates. And Ion says, yeah, I think that makes, makes good sense. So it, it's a case of the divine entering into possession of the human, overflowing, saturating, to use a, a late theologian's term, the everyday world of the human and, and transforming it in so, some ways. So we start out with the gods or the muses. Socrates kind of shifts back and forth. And they inspire the poet. And depending on which, he says, you know, depending on which muse it is, uh, the poet is inspired differently. Different gods inspire different kinds of uh, poetic reflections or reverberations or however you want to conceive of them. And so the poet then writes, communicates, speaks as sort of a mouthpiece of the God. Not in the same way that a soothsayer or a seer or somebody like that in ancient Greece would uh, or, or a prophet if you think about that in the, the Old Testament term. But the poet is being inspired by by the gods. He's being sort of taken out of himself, shown things, um, made to feel things, and then he tries to put that down in, in verse in, in one way or another. Once you've got poetry, now you can have interpreters, and Homer did indeed have many interpreters by the time that Plato is writing, uh, and they would compete against each other for who could be the best interpreter. And part of that meant being able to recite the poetry really well, and, and that does take something. I mean, if you've ever um, tried to, you know, sing a song that you already know, you know that if, if you can't relate to the song, it's hard to sing it well. Um, likewise with, with poetry, if you read poetry and it's just a bunch of words to you, even if you memorize the verses, it's not really going to come across. It works that way with music, too. You practice a piece, and if you can't find something in that piece that you latch on to, you can't interpret it very well, and, and it, just, it comes across being very mechanical. But when you are actually an interpreter who is able to receive the flow of inspiration or enthusiasm uh, from the poet who got it from the god, then you're able to continue that process. You are the next link in that chain. And then you can transfer that to the audience. Now, Socrates doesn't talk about the need for the audience to be cultivated in any way. Um, that would be an interesting wrinkle to add to this. He seems to just think that the audience, look, if the, if the interpreter is doing his job well, the audience is going to get it, they're going to respond, they're going to feel those emotions, they're going to see those images. They're going to be transported out of themselves back into ancient uh, 
you know, Greece or I uh, I Ithaca or Troy. Ithaca, by the way, is part of Greece. I know that, so don't put a comment saying that. Um, but the audience then is also, in a certain way, participating in the divine through the interpreter, through the poet, ultimately going back to the, the god or the muse who inspired them. So that's what Plato, at least in the Ion, represents poetry as doing. Not only poetry, but its successful interpretation. So there's a lot of questions left open here. Um, does this match up with everything else that Plato says about poetry throughout the rest of his corpus? Perhaps not, but we don't need to worry about that here. It's enough to understand, if you want to take away one thing from this, remember that metaphor of the rings, the magnet, the next ring is the poet, the next ring is the interpreter, and the next ring is the audience. All of them suspended by the magnetic force, the divine force coming through them and flowing into them, uh, allowing there to be a continuity there.